honorable dignitaries our delegates and my dear colleagues a very good morning to one and all i am dr jay shukla second prose graduate i am very happy to welcome you all on behalf of our organizing committee to the department of oral medicine and radiology to the cde program according to who cancer is the leading cause of death Oral cancer is the sixth common cancer in the world and has increased mortality rates compared with other malignancies. The early diagnosis of cancer is often curable, but unfortunately, most of the patients report at only advanced stages, making the treatment as combined radiotherapy, chemotherapy, with or without surgery. This causes many oral complications too, which is a challenge for the dental surgeon to treat. Our topic of the day will cover the D suspects. So we look forward to get an exposure to the oral care for patients with chemotherapy. I now request Dr. Sudamani, ma'am, Professor, Department of Oral Medicine and Radiology, to introduce the guest speaker. A very good morning to one and all. With a great immense pleasure, I would like to introduce our guest speaker, Dr. Lalita Kumar Vijay. She is currently working as faculty in College of Dentistry, Department of Maxillofacial Surgery, King Saad bin Abdulaziz University for Health Science, Riyadh, Saudi. She completed her BDS from SRM and MBS from Raja Mutaya. She has an experience of seven years in teaching as well as in clinical experience. She has delivered guest lectures in many conferences and added to her credit, she has published various national international journals and peer reviewed journals. She will be addressing the audience on guidelines for rendering the oral care for cancer patients. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Lalita. So I would just uh, start diving right into the topic, which is uh, a, 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 an easy or a quick guideline for oral care for, uh, for patients on cancer therapy. So to begin with, cancer itself, uh, the breaking the news, uh, the psychological aspect of it, and following uh, the difficulties the patients are going to face after uh, the treatment has been initiated. Everything uh, is a struggle for the patient, for the, both the patient and the family and the doctors. So the bare minimum, what we can do as oral physicians uh, is to give them or deliver them the appropriate oral care. Why is oral care important? Because uh, oral care begins with uh, uh, taking care of your nutrition, taking care of your diet, like say that is the basic uh, uh, reason why a human is living for eating say and uh, give them good nutrition and a good nutrition itself is going to help them a lot uh, when it comes to uh, uh, curing the disease as such so um, uh, I'll just quickly go through the global scenario which is there uh, currently in the world as you all know it is the sixth most common type of cancer with India contributing to almost uh, one third of the burden in the world and uh, it's said to be the second country uh, to have the highest number of oral cancer cases and uh, amongst all the uh, cancer varieties uh, say the oral cancer is almost the third most common in India and uh, when we look at it globally, uh, the US has uh, seemed to have an improved uh, five-year survival rate uh, from the year 2011 to 17. And this was a report which was given by uh, the American Cancer Society. And uh, this improvement they have uh, seen with the improving uh, modern skills of uh, treating by uh, using chemotherapy or radiotherapy or the surgery as such. So uh, when you look at the other parts of the world, say Europe is the second most common uh, 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 area where they have oral cancer followed by uh, Asia. And then they have uh, the other parts of the world like Latin America and Africa. So this is the current global scenario with 
increasing in the case of oral cancer as oral physicians how best we could contribute to the society so as to give the bare minimal uh, say relief or at least a, system, a symptomatic relief uh, like do no harm and then do better for the patients so when we are trying to treat a cancer patient it is not a one man's army it's not any heroism that we see here it is a teamwork and we need utmost con contribution and uh, we need a lot of uh, cooperation between the team members and uh, the team as everybody is at the same level and everybody has to equally contribute so as to uh, give relief to the cancer patients so the team members could be uh, your oral oncologist and the oral physician, maxillofacial radiologist, a restorative dentist and a dietitian, speech and language therapist, uh, plastic surgeon, and last but not the least, the most important person is nursing care because these uh, uh, the nursing care is required before, during, and post cancer therapy, and they are also required to coordinate between all the specialists and amongst all of these. Uh, none of them can perform any sort of a care to the patient without consultant to the oncologist. So this is how the team works and this is a team effort so as to improve the quality of life for the patients. So when it comes to oral care for uh, cancer patients, uh, there are, I broadly classified it into four basic steps. The first one is cancer screening. So uh, whatever patient be it, whether it is a comprehensive care patient or a, a emergency care patient or a limited care patient, whoever be it, whether they are visiting for the first time to our clinic or they are coming uh, as a recall or a, 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 on an appointment basis, then every patient has to be screened for oral cancer. The, uh, the biggest advantage I could say in uh, oral cavity is that we always have a preceding potentially malignant disorder, which means we can catch it before the malignant transformation or at least we can delay the uh, process of transformation. So once that is done and then we perform the, uh, say, oral cancer treatment, what has to be followed? The, whatever we follow for uh, the care is either before the uh, cancer treatment during the cancer treatment and what is the care that we are supposed to give after the cancer treatment and this is a continuous process this is not something like the patient is a cancer patient he walks into a dental clinic we do some basic treatments and then we forget about them no this is a patient who is going to be uh, coming to you throughout their life and you will have to give them a good oral care and follow-up so uh, this most of you must be knowing, it's just a quick uh, uh, eight step that we have to follow in oral screening, beginning with the gingiva, followed by the lip, buccal mucosa, vestibule, heart palate, the tonsillar area, ventral surface of the tongue and lateral border of the tongue. So this will hardly take a couple of minutes for screening for each and every patient that walks into our clinic. And uh, just a quick uh, review about the treatment for oral cancer. Uh, this treatment uh, flowchart is not a hard and fast rule. When it comes to treatment of cancer, it is more, uh, say, highly individualized and it cannot be a hard and fast rule that if this is the clinical feature and this is the treatment. Each patient responds to treatment uh, differently. However, we just uh, uh, try to uh, sort it out into a flowchart, like whether the cancer is resectable or unresectable, meaning if I am able to remove the bulk of the tumor and the remaining can be uh, removed with uh, say uh, chemotherapy or a radiotherapy or a combination therapy in case the tumor is more widespread i would like to reduce the bulk using chemo radio and then once the bulk bulk is reduced i would like to do a surgical uh, intervention so this is in uh, in concise about the treatment for oral cancer so I would like to tell where all uh, 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 the uh, treatment can have an implication or a complication and how we can intervene as an oral physician so as to uh, improve the quality of life for these patients. So a quick uh, review about the uh, chemotherapy and radiotherapy procedures, as you might all know. Chemotherapy is just by uh, administering some cytotoxic drugs and it is given in IV. And uh, here you have this uh, device which is uh, controlled 
like how much of ml of uh, the chemotherapeutic agent has to enter the patient's bloodstream so this is uh, um, administered through this device and we have a lot of drugs like your cisplatin carboplatin and uh, antimetabolites like your fluorouracil and uh, bleomycin uh, uh, such as your anthracyclines and antimycotics so these are some of the chemotherapeutic agents so now uh, where does the patient need care when the chemotherapeutic agent enters the patient's bloodstream it's not the it cannot exactly identify the cancer cell and kill only the cancer cell it will uh, kill the rapidly dividing cells or normally what happens in a patient's body rapidly multiplying cells the cells which have a high mitotic rate so this could be even the normal epithelial turnover that is happening all over the body so this is where the patient's complications begin so the killing of not just the normal cells but also rapidly dividing cells and uh, when it comes to radiotherapy uh, say more than the chemo the radiotherapy has immensely evolved right from a two dimensional radiotherapy to three dimensional radiotherapy and the latest advancements is the igrt or imrt or the stereotactic radiotherapy so uh, what is the aim or what, what is the goal why did they transform so much why was there so much of uh, advancements that was required so when a radiation is being administered to the patient it is not just the area where the tumor is the radiation falls even the surrounding structures uh, the radiation falls and there are side effects to the surrounding structures so uh, what best can we do or what modality can we uh, uh, adapt to so that the surrounding structures are not getting irradiated so much something like your imrt was developed where the normal tissue was spared as much as possible and the entire concentration of radiotherapy was focused on to the tumor so this they did it by you know uh, using various x rays that is being taken uh, throughout the pe period of radiotherapy and the patient uh, is being exposed to the radiation and the radiation is uh, going on the it's hitting on the patient at different points on the patient so the concentration of the radiation reaches only at the point of tumor and the surrounding structures yes it does receive the radiotherapy but at a minimal concentration so these are some of the advances of radiotherapy which is helping the patient to reduce the post op complications yes so i was talking about uh, post op complications post cancer therapy complications so let's see uh, what are the complications that we might see in these cancer patients and how we are going to overcome these complications so patients uh, will have general manifestations of say uh, nausea vomiting and uh, they'll have loss of hair loss of appetite and then uh, uh, there'll be excessive weakness and excessive bleeding which is leading them to anemia and when it comes to oral manifestations where we can contribute and uh, give a better care for the patients it's mucositis candidiasis xerostomia radiation fibrosis loss of taste trismus uh, gingival hypoplasia that's because of the uh, cyclosporins that we administer as a immunosuppressant and uh, last but not the least osteonecrosis so these are some of the complications that occur in the oral cavity now uh, i will be sharing with you how to manage these patients so i wanted to give a quick recap of what exactly oral cancer patients go through and uh, what are the uh, uh, what are the manifestations and then uh, uh, how best we can guide the patients as of them so uh, i have divided the oral care guidelines into three parts one is prior to cancer therapy what are the measures that we should follow second is uh, during cancer therapy and third is post cancer therapy so the first one before initiating the cancer therapy uh, say a, a patient is walking up to you to a dental clinic you cannot directly jump and start into the treatment first you will have to consult the oncologist and get to know the uh, nature of the uh, cancer and how badly it is affected or what precautions you must take so as dentist it is our duty to take a uh, proper medical history and uh, a proper record of what the patients uh, are going to go through and second would be uh, posting them for investigations why so because the cancer itself will cause uh, patients to have uh, anemia leukopenia and platelet uh, reduction thrombocytopenia and this could be not because of the cancer treatment but because of the cancer itself so which means any invasive procedures that we perform it can uh, likely have post op complications because of these blood levels so once the investigations are done and then with the necessary precautions we begin our dental care 
the first and foremost is oral hygiene uh one the patient might not be psychologically compatible or the patient would already have been in pain following which they don't feel motivated uh, to follow the oral hygiene precautions so the first and foremost step in uh, taking uh, care of oral cancer patients or any cancer patients for that, for that matter is to identify the potential source of infection and remove the same so we begin that with a thorough scaling followed by oral hygiene instructions and a use of alcohol free mouthwash and the most commonly what we prescribe is a chlorhexidine gluconate mouthwash and uh, if the patient is finding the mouth to be sore then we can do it at a dilution of 1 is to 1 and the most commonly uh, used concentration is somewhere around 0.12% to 0.2% of mouthwash here the patient is uh, asked to take 10 ml of the uh, mouthwash rinse it thoroughly and spit it and a minimum of uh, 30 minutes gap should be given between the brushing and the mouthwash so that the effect of the the mouthwash remains there so this was the first step in the care and uh, moving on to the second step these patients since the oral hygiene might not be so good they will be they'll be more prone to or uh, caries risk so in that case we will first have to involve the dietitian here give them a low uh, sugar content uh, calorie diet and uh, make sure they receive proper nutrition so nutrition is the key uh, uh, the food itself is considered as medicine so nutrition is the key we'll have to consult with a dietitian and give them a proper care there and if we see any small restorable caries we would recommend uh, to uh, fill it with a glass inoma cements because of the constant fluoride release it gives a long term benefit and when we are prescribing medicines it is advisable to give uh, sugar free medicines and uh, also use a fluoridated toothpaste uh, twice a day so this is the care uh, when, it, uh, when it comes to caries risk now moving on to uh, when you are going to begin in some invasive treatments so when there is an invasive treatment such as an extraction being planned then antibiotic prophylaxis is recommended because a patient would be uh, immunosuppressed and patient will have uh, features of neutropenia they might be susceptible to infection so uh, which tooth has to be extracted when it comes to the tooth that requires extraction any teeth that uh, is in line of the uh, tumor whether the teeth uh, has a doubtful prognosis somewhere poor prognosis or it is directly associated with the uh, radiation the area where we are going to radiate and we feel it post during the treatment the tooth might cause pain or problem then those teeth are extracted and the teeth extraction is strictly avoided as much as possible during the radiotherapy and uh, next coming to taking of impressions we'll have to take uh, alginate impressions preferably uh, this is taken to uh, 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 to fabricate a model cast and this is done say if we want to do a fluoride application we can make custom trays and second for obturator planning it is ideal to do this step before uh, the initiation of cancer therapy because after that patient might have uh, soreness of mouth mucositis or restricted mouth opening because of radiation fibrosis then the impression making patient might not be very compliant with and the next step would be uh, removing sources of trauma like uh, you know there is sharp teeth so you can do a coronoplasty some old restorations which uh, can be a source of accumulation of debris so polishing of say amalgam restorations and uh, the next would be if it's a younger patient or patients are on uh, orthodontic treatment it has to be discontinued uh, so why is orthodontic treatment recommended to be discontinued is uh, it has an increased susceptibility for uh, dental caries and also there is a risk of uh, root stunting because, due to the tooth movement and uh, the drugs which we give such as the bisphosphonates or anti resorptive drugs uh, that is a chemotherapeutic drugs can inhibit the tooth movement so the purpose of uh, going through the orthodontic treatment is not solved uh, moreover the uh, the brackets or the wires the uh, night eye wires stainless steel wires any of it if it is sharp at any point of time it could prick and traumatize the patient and cause more uh, discomfort to the patient so ideally orthodontic treatment has to be discontinued before initiation of cancer treatment so uh, these were the precautions that we'll have to follow uh, before uh, cancer treatment now i'm moving over to what are the treatments or precautions that we'll have to follow as oral physicians 
for during cancer therapy. So uh, to begin with, uh, we'll have to maintain the oral hygiene. So I will be repeating this point of oral hygiene uh, almost before, during, and after. Why? Because that is the prime uh, source or, or the prime activity that as uh, a dentist we are supposed to deliver to the patient, oral hygiene maintenance. So that has to be happening throughout the period of cancer therapy. Uh, the next would be Patients in cancer therapy will be susceptible to infections because of immune suppressions, especially if they are patients who are undergoing uh, bone marrow transplants. In those cases, uh, they are likely to develop some viral infections such as herpes, for which we prescribe uh, acyclovir, and uh, the salivary flow starts uh, getting altered, for which we prescribe antifungal medicines to pro for managing of candidiasis. So the recommendation uh, for uh, antifungals is a nystatin oral suspension of about one lakh units four times per day. And if it's a case of a severe candidiasis, then we go in for tablets version of it, that is the fluconazole, 50 milligrams per day. And it is given for up to 14 days or at least maximum until it resolves. So uh, now moving over to the uh, foodstuffs that has to be avoided yes so we are consulting the dietitian again just like the oral hygiene which has to be done throughout the period of cancer treatment we'll also have to consult the dietitian throughout the period of the treatment so uh, we'll have to advise the patient to avoid any foodstuffs that is going to irritate their oral mucosa anything hard spicy any uh, sharp foodstuffs flavored uh, foodstuffs uh, has to be avoided and apart from this uh, anti-tobacco counseling and alcohol uh, advice should be given to the patient again before, during and post cancer therapy. So uh, this is about the dietary advice to the patient and next coming to invasive dental treatment. So we will have to uh, complete all invasive dental treatment before uh, the uh, initiation of cancer therapy. So now there is a, a evidence base or say a debatable concept of when to uh, do the invasive dental treatments. So ideally they say 30 days before the cancer therapy, it is best to do invasive treatment. But usually when we, when we come to practical aspects, we don't have 30 days to maintain a patient's oral hygiene and then start the cancer therapy. So cancer uh, is uh, taking the priority stand there. So then uh, there are varying, uh, say, uh, varying reports and uh, varying author uh, uh, feelings that uh, uh, publications which says that uh, somewhere at least 14 days or minimum, minimum 10 days it has to be done, the, the dental treatment has to be done before initiating the cancer therapy. So why are they avoiding it during the cancer therapy is that patient's mouth will be sore and patient will be susceptible to infection and there is risk of something called as osteonecrosis of the jaw which I will be telling you subsequently. So ideally during dental treatment you will have to avoid all sorts of invasive dental treatments. Now coming to uh, the next problem that is the hyposalivation. So once a cancer treatment is being initiated, say there is a chemo or a radiotherapy of the head and neck more specifically, the salivary glands get atrophied and the uh, amount of salivary flow starts reducing. So uh, by definition, hyposalivation is a reduced uh, resting salivary flow rate below 0.2 ml per minute or a, a stimulated salivary flow rate which is less than 0.7 ml per minute. So this is the uh, definition of hyposalivation. Uh, perhaps uh, a, a quick note for the postgraduate students here. What is the difference between hyposalivation and xerostomia? And why we have, we'll have to know about it. What is the significance of it? So hyposalivation is something, uh, it's basically a objective sign. So uh, look at the words, it's an objective sign, which means we do a, uh, a test or an investigation where we ask the patient to spit into a cup and then we measure the saliva at the end of one minute. So this is hyposalivation, what the physician is eliciting from the patient. And xerostomia is an objective symptom. So, uh, uh, so I mean, it's a subjective symptom. So it's something like the patient says, I have a feeling of dry mouth. So xerostomia is a completely subjective symptom where I cannot see it, but the patient is giving me a history of dry mouth. So that's the difference between the two. And once uh, the cancer therapy is initiated, the salivary glands get affected, the SNR cells get atrophied, and the saliva begins to become more thick and stringy. 
So the major functions of saliva is getting affected, such as the buffering capacity, the clearance of the debris from the oral cavity, the pH becomes more acidic. So once all these happens, it is favoring the growth of microorganisms and more specifically, karyogenic microorganisms. And this is what is making the patient very susceptible to dental caries. So um, uh, uh, when saliva is getting reduced, like in hyposalivation, uh, the patient also has three problems with speech, mastigation, swallowing, and there is increased risk of uh, other gingival periodontal problems. So when we have a patient with uh, hyposalivation, the uh, treatment modality begins from, say, in mild cases, we can advise them to take frequent sips of water, definitely a regular water, not the sparkled one, and uh, chewing of sugarless chewing gum, xylitol. But there are some side effects of uh, xylitol as well, uh, such as uh, ca causing bloating and flatulence. Uh, when it comes to medication, the first one uh, recommended was uh, amifostin. Uh, amifostin was given as a radioprotective agent to the salivary glands, but currently it's a topic of debate. Uh, there are some authors who suggest that it doesn't make a difference whether we prescribe amifostin or not, the outcome is still the same. However, we have good randomized control trials, uh, which has proven the efficacy of uh, pilocarpin uh, and uh, sevimelin. So pilocarpin is basically a cholinergic parasympath uh, parasympathomimetic uh, agent, which is given at the rate of 5 to 10 milligrams three times a day. And uh, when it comes to sevimelin, uh, it is a muscarinic, uh, uh, muscarinic agonist, which is an M M1, acts on M1 and M3 receptors, and they are given at the rate of 30 milligrams. Both of these have uh, a common side effect, say, like excessive sweating and uh, frequent urination. Otherwise, these med uh, medications have proven to be useful for patients having uh, hyposalivation. So apart from the medications, uh, there are some commercially available uh, salivary substitutes. I believe in India, we have these commercial products like uh, wet mouth, we have oral lube, salivar, and aquacid. So uh, when it comes to these uh, salivary substitutes, uh, it is uh, there are some evidence which says that the gel form which comes in the aquasib has in, it has a longer duration of benefit than the liquid form. And uh, a, a point that has to be noted here, some of these products has animal combinations, uh, animal uh, uh, based ingredients, which can be culturally uh, not acceptable uh, uh, in some conditions. And uh, we should also focus uh, on um, the salivary substitute products, if it is available with fluoride. So whenever we're prescribing a salivary substitute, it is uh, mandatory to go through the ingredients of it. And uh, uh, there is evidence which also states that mucin-based salivary substitutes have a higher clinical acceptance than uh, carboxy uh, methyl cellulose-based substitutes. So that was about uh, the hyposalivation and xerostomia. Now moving over to mucositis inflammation or ulceration of oral mucosal lining and this is a the perhaps the first complication that occurs in uh, almost two weeks following radiotherapy there is mucositis and who has graded and this is almost the universally accepted grading as grade one as um, soreness and grade two as erythema and grade three where the patient is not able to swallow food and grade four is where the patient cannot uh, the ailment is not possible at all so based on this uh, inflammation where the food, the diet is being a big problem for the patient, uh, there are several uh, randomized control trials, there are several uh, systematic reviews that they have uh, proposed and uh, to uh, cons come to a con common consensus for treating this uh, painful condition. So if you have, if you can find some time to go through the supportive care in uh, oral cancer journal, and there are some clinical practical guidelines also available. So in short, what they're trying to say is uh, you can try oral cooling for 30 minutes before the chemotherapy and use of benzidamine hydrochloride mouthwash 0.15%, uh, 15 ml, 4 to 8 times per day and some palliative management just to reduce the pain, say 2% lignocaine mouthwash, fentanyl dermal patches, 2% of morphine mouth rinse and uh, finally, if it's very severe cases, then systemic pain relief with morphine. Now coming to uh, maintenance of oral hygiene using foam swabs. 
Why is foam swab important? Say during cancer therapy, where the patient's mouth is extremely sore, they're not able to brush. Say there is radiation fibrosis, uh, the brush is not reaching the, uh, you know, the far end of the mouth then foam swabs can be used these are some of the commercially available ones this can be uh, dipped in normal saline or moistened with uh, alcohol free chlorhexidine mouthwash and just to clean the oral cavity so this can be ideally done by the nursing staff or the caregivers and they are being trained to do this however uh, this does not uh, provide adequate uh, oral hygiene and cleaning so for this uh, normal toothbrushing has to be resumed as early as possible so these are the precautions that we'll have to follow during the cancer therapy with specific emphasis on uh, uh, mucositis and uh, hyposalivation. So now I'm going to uh, talk about uh, following cancer therapy. What are the precautions that we have to take uh, uh, for the patients? So now uh, when it comes to children, I haven't been talking about children. Well, I, at the end of the session, I have one quick note about uh, care for children as well. The growth and development has to be monitored every six months. The problem with them is they would be in a growing age and it can cause stunted growth of the teeth. The tooth eruptive force might have lost because of the treatment. So uh, the, uh, the uh, growth and development of the jaws could have been a problem. So uh, initially interven intervening at that stage and then helping them to grow better would be a good uh, mode of treatment. And then again, as I said, oral hygiene maintenance, which is happening before, during and after cancer therapy. And uh, this is a period where you can go for elective dental treatment post therapy in case something new comes up, some new infection starts up, yes, we can do some elective dental treatment, restorations to restore aesthetics and function, and dental extractions with complete precautions has to be done. And um, once these elective treatments are over, uh, we can expect some fungal infections where we prescribe uh, antifungals. Now coming to um, obturator Sorry, now coming to the denture care. Um, patients who are wearing complete dentures or removable partial dentures, uh, we must advise them not to wear. It is This advice is given before, during and after cancer therapy because it might traumatize the patient and the denture rubbing against the sore oral mucosa can aggravate the pain as well. And if that is not really a complication for the patient and the patient feels okay and, and, and sort of comfortable wearing the dentures, then we must strictly advise them not to wear them at night and rinse it every meal, rinse it following every meal. And for maintenance, it has to be cleaned once daily using a toothbrush and uh, it is being kept uh, soaked in the night using chlorhexidine mouthwash and commercially a Milton solution is available, which is uh, nothing but one in 80 dilution of uh, sodium hypochlorite solution. Uh, however, this uh, Milton solution is not advised when there are some metal components, say the clasps is present, which can cause erosion or um, it can cause rusting of the uh, metal components. And apart from this, uh, denture stomatitis, because of the reduced salivary flow, we can expect denture stomatitis. So uh, meconosal gel is applied onto the fitting surface or the denture surface of the denture, and then it is uh, reinserted into the patient's mouth. So as a bottom line, ideally the denture wear has to be discontinued until the patient is completely uh, uh, disease free in the oral cavity. If the patient still wants to wear it, yes, they have to follow these precautions. Now coming to obturator care. Uh, so we had taken uh, regular impressions and made study model and cast models uh, before the initiation of cancer therapy. So based on those casts, we can fabricate uh, uh, obturators. Obturators are similar to uh, removable partial dentures, but they are placed to close the surgical defect following the treatment, say they have done a partial maxillectomy. So there is a, a defect which is there in the maxilla and that is closed in uh, with the obturator. And there are a lot of uh, say models of obturators. This is a simple one uh, which has an obturator and the set of teeth, so which is going to duly help the patient. And this is the one where there is more portion of maxilla lost. So there is a metal, uh, metal mesh reinforcement in the obturator. And here the entire maxilla is missing. So uh, patient has been having a 
implant supported obturator in place and then the occlusion is being restored so uh, when it comes to obturation uh, obturator care uh, we'll have to instruct the patient to keep the obturator clean the patient should not remove the obturator at all for six months so if they leave it outside for a couple of days then we can expect wound contracture which can be a major complication while healing so this and, and in case in, in case the patient is having pain uh, while uh, using the obturator then he'll have to immediately report back to the restorative dentist and get it adjusted or if not uh, fabricate a new obturator uh, so that uh, the patient gets comfortable but the patient should not discontinue the use of obturator for the first six months uh, now moving over to trismus which is a, a re restricted mouth opening or limited mouth opening and the cause for this could be an active spasm or restriction of the muscles of mastigation it could also be because of uh, the tumor itself or maybe a local recurrence or metastatic lesions uh, sometimes following uh, surgery and chemotherapy, the trismus can happen, but it uh, generally tends to be reversible when it is following surgery. And uh, when there is fibrosis of tissues as a result of chemotherapy and radiotherapy, especially radiotherapy, it is called as radiation uh, fibrosis, then it tends to be more progressive and uh, the damage that is caused because of radiation is pretty much irreversible. So when uh, we have a patient of trismus, we can begin with physical therapy that is the jaw exercises the, there are some devices which are available for stretching the muscles of mastigation uh, the most simple one is just stacking a lot of tongue depressor or your ice cream sticks tie them up together and ask the patient to keep it in the incisal edge and uh, keep an, uh, keep it in the oral cavity say for a period of five minutes ten minutes and then gradually increase it so this is one method of uh, physical exercise the second one, there are some commercially available devices. The first one is uh, terabyte jaw motion rehabilitation, where the uh, the slots that you see here, it is uh, more is the slot, more is the mouth opening. And here you have a U-shaped arch, one for the maxilla and one for the mandible. The patient has to hold the device inside his mouth and try to increase the mouth opening as much as possible. And then the other system is the Dynasplint system. Here, uh, the difference between the two systems, if I can say, is this is a hands-free system. In terabyte jaw system, uh, the patient has to hold the device. In the Dynasplint uh, Trismus system, the patient has to fit the device in the mouth and it's hands-free. So that's about the physical therapy for Trismus. Coming to the drug therapy, uh, the first prescribed is pentoxifilin, which is given around at the rate of 800 milligrams. And pentoxifilin is basically an antioxidant and it increases the microcirculation and tissue oxygenation. Thereby, it starts relieving the uh, fibrosis in the muscles of mastigation. And the second drug of choice is botulinum toxin. This injection is not given to improve the mouth opening. However, there will be some pain associated with trismus, so for which botulinum toxin uh, injection is prescribed. The third modality, if say nothing of the none of the uh, treatment above works for the patient, uh, then uh, there is a study which states that coronoidectomy uh, can be done. That is uh, the surgical removal of coronoids, which can increase the range of motion and help the patient to eat and uh, uh, do oral hygiene practices better. So that was about the uh, trismus. Now uh, coming to uh, osteo radio necrosis. So this is nothing but, um, as a, it's, it's a type of osteomyelitis following radiotherapy. And the risk factors for this could be uh, 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 a heavy dose of radiation and uh, the fractions are very close together. The doses are high and the patient is not maintaining good oral hygiene and uh, aggravating factors like uh, tobacco and alcohol. Uh, doing invasive treatments during uh, during the radiotherapy can all predispose the condition to osteoradio necrosis. So patient will have some deep seated pain. There can be pus discharge and there will be sequestration of bone with significant bone loss that you can uh, appreciate on radiographs. And uh, there is a, a, a universally accepted staging where stage zero is mucosal defects, stage two is uh, necrotic bone in the dentalular region, and stage two there is involvement of uh, denuded bone, and uh, stage four is uh, full-fledged uh, necrotic bone, and there can be even pathological fracture. So uh, to avoid 
severe complications and immediate intervention is mandated for this case. And for this, uh, the prescribed treatment is a high dose of systemic antibiotics, say amoxicillin with clavulanic acid and pentoxypillin again here uh, it's prescribed because it inf inhibits the inflammatory mechanism it promotes the uh, fibroblast proliferation and also the formation of extracellular matrix so it improves the condition basically and uh, vitamin e tocopherol of thousand international units per day has been uh, prescribed which protects the cell membrane uh, when uh, the uh, when it's more of the later stages stage two or stage three then we'll have to uh, remove the necrotic bone so a local surgical excision with a primary mucosal uh, closure has been recommended. And in case of severe ORN, hyperbaric oxygen therapy has been suggested. However, um, uh, evidence does not strongly suggest this treatment, but still this has been uh, uh, in practice. And for advanced cases, uh, ablative surgery and soft tissue reconstruction has been uh, proposed. Uh, moving over to uh, MRONCH or medication related osteonecrosis of the jaw. So, osteoradionecrosis is uh, say necrosis of the jaw following radiation. And uh, MRONCH is necrosis of the bone following medications of chemotherapy that they prescribe. Say the anti resorptive drugs such as bisphosphonates, monoclonal antibodies, denosumab. So, all these prescriptions which are ideally prescribed for uh, bone uh, to prevent bone resorption. So these medicines can cause, um, uh, say, uh, a necrotic bone when some invasive treatments or some uh, residual dental infection is present in the patient. So uh, if there, there are some interesting systematic review uh, reads and there is an uh, in, interesting position paper by the American Association of Maxillofacial Surgeons. Uh, why? Because this topic of, uh, is of particular interest where it, it is more of a recent finding. It was uh, uh, discovered first by, Ms., uh, by Marx in 2007, and subsequently they started seeing more of these cases. Uh, in 2014, the American Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons had updated the term from bisphosphonates related to osteonecrosis of the jaw to medication-related osteonecrosis of the jaw. The name change itself was... Uh, 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 was a recent update there. So this is more of a uh, recent pathology that has been come into study. And by 2021, we have already started having systematic reviews on how to manage the condition, how to identify the condition, how to differentiate this condition from perhaps a second uh, uh, primary tumor or a second carcinoma or a metastatic carcinoma. There are a lot of interesting uh, systematic reviews on it. So, uh, the same uh, article which I had shown you before the position paper had proposed uh, guidelines for treating such cases. So M based on the stages. So if it is an MRON stage zero, then there is just tooth pain or joint uh, or the jaw pain for which they prescribe antibiotics and then uh, analgesia for the pain. And if it's stage one, there is asymptomatic focal bone necrosis without signs of inflammation, then uh, they add antibacterial mouthwash to it. When it comes to stage two, where there is significant pain along with the other features, then um, uh, bone debridement is added to along the other treatments. When it comes to stage three, where there is necrosis, extensive bone loss, and then uh, symptoms of inflammation and significant pain, then we do all the above treatments combined together and give a comprehensive treatment to the patient. I just want to uh, show you a quick, uh, quick uh, case scenario. Uh, this is a case which we saw a couple of uh, years ago in our clinics and uh, in our college. And uh, this patient had reported to us, say, with a swelling in her mandibular anterior. So how did we treat this patient? Uh, we just went through uh, the history of the patient. We found that uh, she was a breast cancer patient and she was under denosumab. And... Uh, she had severe pain in the lower anteriors. Uh, we just went on to taking uh, an OPG. We found some rarefaction in the bones and then we took a uh, CBCT where we found a lingual cortical plate was uh, breached and a bit of the buccal cortical plate as well. And uh, the uh, histopathology also confirmed our diagnosis. There was a lot of areas of necrosis there. So this patient had reported to us with swelling, pain and pus discharge. So now it, uh, our duty as physicians to treat her uh, symptoms, uh, we had prescribed uh, clindamycin 300 milligrams and metronidazole uh, 200 milligrams and uh, ibuprofen uh, 200 milligrams. We are doing this course for almost 14 days. 
we uh, sent her back to her uh, oncologist so as to whether she could be uh, uh, changed to some other medication or whether this drug could be stopped for one month until this heals and yes they gave her gave her an alternate prescription following that uh, uh we uh, we couldn't completely resolve it with just the medication so since she was a stage 3 m ronch we had done a sequestrometry of the bone and uh, we tried to preserve her inferior border of the mandible uh and post op we followed the same medications as we started the pre op as well so this is how we managed this particular patient i just wanted to share a clinical experience with you now coming to the last part of it uh, when it comes to child care uh one the child compliance or understanding might not be the same as that of the adult so uh when it comes to child care it is educating the patients parents and caregivers is more important than trying to make the child understand so we can begin with uh, educating them to brush twice a day and if it's a baby who is less than uh, 10 years use of 1500 ppm of fluoridated toothpaste and uh, specifically tell them not to spit after uh, using the paste so that the effect of fluoride remains in the tooth for longer periods and the toothbrush has to be changed uh, Uh, regularly once in three months, or when the whistles play, whichever is earlier. When it's uh, a child more than eight years of age, then a fluoridated mouth rinse uh, can be used. Commonly, the 0.05 percent of sodium fluoride. Perhaps by this age, um, they'll come to a better understanding of how to use a mouth rinse. And uh, if the patient is feeling the mouth is too sore, they are, uh, you know, they are. very resistant to brushing uh, then the swabs can be used which i had mentioned previously or a small size toothbrush can be used and uh, say if it's a newborn baby or a baby who does not have any teeth then you'll have to instruct the caregivers as to how to clean with these sponges if it's a slightly elder patient somewhere above 10 years and uh, both the patient and the caregivers are motivated then flossing is even a better idea for this child care now when it comes to diet for child care what uh, every parent or caregiver will be really concerned is to maintain their weight and give them adequate nutrition and this has to be given without uh, giving excessive sugary intakes so they'll have to restrict the sugary intake and uh, to only meal time somewhere three to four times a day and if still they have they will have to take it then you can um, say uh, suggest them to use straws so that the drink directly goes into the uh, throat and not in uh, resting on the teeth so this is in short about uh, child care in uh, oral cancer therapy so uh, i with this i conclude my um, uh, my lecture and in short what we'll have to say is any cancer patient will be in a lot of pain and uh, they require a continuous uh, a continuous uh, care for them before during and post care uh, post cancer treatment as well and uh, more than giving them a physical care and physical oral care they need a lot of psychological counseling also to beat the cancer dental college for giving me this opportunity and i hope uh, uh, the lecture was useful to a few of you thank you so much thank you so much ma'am for your valuable information regarding oral care for patients in cancer therapy ma'am it will definitely help us in future and your presentation was so nice with many pictures uh, references and case scenario ma'am it will definitely help us and all these valuable insight gave us a new perspective that one should adopt uh, to manage the complication of cancer therapy ma'am now i would like to call dr shivaraman sir reader to present the certificate of appreciation to the speaker dr lalita kumar bijay ma'am yeah thank you dr lalita this was and wonderfully a wonderful presentation from you okay and thanks for enlightening us with your vast knowledge and experience through this webinar and thank you once again please to accept our uh, certificate of appreciation as a token of love thank you sir I now request Dr. Shri Swarleya, second year postgraduate, to propose the oath of thanks. On behalf of organizing team, it may privilege to deliver the oath of thanks. I would like to thank our dean, sir, Dr. Gokul Nathan, principal and HOD of Department of Oral Medicine and Radiology, Dr. Balan, staff members of Oral Medicine and Radiology, organizing committee. 
and delegates of various colleges and departments for making this CD program a grand success. I would like to thank our guest speaker, Dr. Larita Kumar Vijay, ma'am, for giving us a detailed and informative lecture on oral care for patients in cancer therapy. Once again, I thank one and all present here. Thank you.